Well, God bless you, friends. Thank you for joining us for another evening for our Sunday school on Saturday. Certainly, we're blessed and honored and privileged uh, to be uh, to, for you to join us on this evening. God has been good to us. God bless our superintendent, Superintendent Vester, Assistant Superintendent Mother Forward, and to all of you, the people of the Lord, and amen, you our students who've taken out the time to join us tonight. Tonight we have a wonderful lesson, Salvation for All Who Believe. And this is lesson nine, dated for August the 1st, 2021. Let's have a word of prayer. Father and God, we thank you today. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your people. God, we thank you for this time of fellowship, this time of sharing, this time of teaching the word of God. It is our prayer now, Lord, that you would open up our understanding. God, that you would give us creativity. Lord, that you would bless your people. Bless all those who hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Salvation for all who believe. And our Bible truth declares that Paul proclaims the good news that salvation is available to everyone. That's right. Salvation is available to everyone. And the Bible basis of this lesson, for those that want to follow along with us, please go to Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 17. And our memory verse is Romans 10 and 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And our lesson aim, uh, the aim of this lesson is to support Paul's confidence in the salvation offered in Christ. Secondly, to feel justified through our faith in Christ. And thirdly, to enjoy the possibility for all. And once again, our lesson scripture is found in Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 17. Let's begin with our introduction to see exactly uh, what the Apostle Paul was referring to when we deal with the light on the word. Now, what is the light on the word? The word of faith. The Apostle's letter reaffirms the fundamental doctrine of salvation by faith, not works, available to Jews and Gentiles alike. He also affirmed that preaching as a form of word of mouth promotion continues to be a primary way to spread the gospel and to build a foundation of faith necessary to desire and receive salvation. Israel and God's plan of salvation in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul addresses Israel's past election, present rejection of the gospel, and their future salvation. How is God's promise to Abraham and the nation of Israel valid while the nation of Israel as a whole seem to have no part in the spread of the gospel. Paul maintains that God's promise to Israel has not failed because the promise was only meant for true Israel, meaning those who were faithful to the promise. Paul contends that Israel's failure to respond to Christ is not due to an unconditional uh, decree of God, but to their unbelief and disobedience. And many people fail to realize that through unbelief and through disobedience, through unbelief and disobedience, they disinherit themselves from the promises and they disinherit themselves out of the will of God. Therefore, it is important that we both believe and obey. The apostle also affirms that Israel's rejection is only partial and temporary. The nation will eventually accept God's salvation in Christ. God has turned Israel's transgression into an opportunity to proclaim salvation to all the world. Belief in Jesus Christ by a portion of national Israel would take place in the future. The scriptures are full of promises and eventual restoration of Israel to God through their acceptance of the Messiah. Now, what is the fertility of the law? Romans 10 and 5, for Moses described it, the law, I'm sorry, described it, the righteousness, which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. The man which doeth these things shall live by them. In other words, what Paul was saying is, he said, Moses gave us the law. He gave us the law. What is the law? The law is a strict set of rules that must be abided by, that Israel had to abide by 
Number one, because they were no longer under the Pharaoh. They were no longer under any governance. They were they had come out of a monarchy. Now, we understand that there are three different forms of government. Monarchy, theocracy, and then we have a democracy. Now, a monarchy is a society that is ruled or governed by a king or queen, by a particular family. That's a monarch. They are known as monarchs. We have kings, kings such and such, queens such and such. That's a monarchy. Then we have what's known as a democracy. A democracy is what we in America are supposed to abide by. A democracy is where leaders are elected, freely elected by the will of the people. So in the United States and in other countries, we have what's known as democracy, or supposed to be a democracy. Um, I mean, we can argue the fact that it's not, but we could also we have to say that we are living in a democratic state. That is, we have the right to choose. That's a democracy. Then we have theocracy. What is a theocracy? A theocracy is where a nation of people, a set of people, they make an agreement that they will be governed by God or by the laws of God. Here in the wilderness, after Israel had left the monarchy in Egypt, God gives to Moses commandments. We know them as the Ten Commandments. Not only did Moses receive from God the Ten Commandments, however, he also received what was known as the Law. The Law. The first five books of the Bible are known as the Pentateuch, known as the Pentateuch. The books of the Law, or the Torah, the books of the Law. Genesis, which is the first book, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All five of those books have the same author. The author of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is Moses. Moses is the author. Somebody said, well, how is it that Moses knew what happened in Genesis? You have to understand that in Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was our form and void. That between Genesis 1 and 1, and uh, you get to verses 2 and 3, we're talking about millions and billions of years there. However, God gives Moses the story, or he gives more Moses the outline of how the world was created, how everything came into being, and he speaks to Moses on the mountain. That's why Moses was on the mountain for a long time because he was recording the events that God had given unto him. Beloved, it is important that we understand that the word of God, that's why the Bible says in Psalms 68 and 11, that the Lord gave the word and great was the company of those who published it. So the word that God gave to Moses on the mountain in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, even though, I mean, Genesis gives us the history of the nation of Israel, how Israel ended up in Egypt. And then we pick up in Exodus how the scripture talks about the fact that there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph or his works. And then it talks about how Moses became a great deliverer for the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. When they were delivered out of the land of Egypt, they had no form of governance. They had no form of law. Therefore, one had to be established, so God gives the law to Moses. He tell Moses what to write. He tell Moses how the children of Israel, how to live, what they are to eat, what they are to drink, the animals they are to live by, eat, things of that nature. So that's why we have the law. And the law itself was so strict until the law said an eye for an eye. And a two for two. I mean, the law was, I mean, it, it was hard to live by the law. People had to abide by the law. But what must be understood is that the law was necessary to bring us to a point of grace. So then, what is the fertility of the law? 
Paul enlightened Gentile and Jewish believers about the futility of trying to be saved by the law. He explains that no man can be saved by meeting such high standards set by the law. To be saved by the law, a person would have to live according to the ethics and in that mosaic law of including the added interpretations of the scribes and Pharisees, which only Jesus Christ could do. Sinning, even one time, would be a disqualification. Paul explains that God gave the law, not to save us, but to show us how guilty we are before a holy God, to show how lost we are, and to acknowledge our dilemma. The law raises a standard to let everyone know what sin is. The sacrificial system of the law to atone for sins demonstrated the need for a lamb without blemish. So this is what the law did. Moses had to give the children of Israel the law a strict set of rules and guidelines to abide by while in the wilderness in order to protect and preserve the lineage of the Israelites in order to protect and preserve the lineage of Christ because Christ himself was to come down through uh, that law. Now, <clears throat> Jews and Gentiles. Paul's letter to the church is written to both Jewish and Gentile Christians. It is the overflowing with the theme of salvation through faith in Christ and not of works. In addressing Jewish and Gentile Christians, Paul creates an environment of peace and unity rooted in faith in Christ. So then, what did he do? Christ fulfills the law. Let's look at verse 6 and 7. Christ fulfilled the law. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring down Christ from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up again from the dead. Christ is the end of the law. Notice now, he's the end of the law. With his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus fulfilled the purpose or the goal of the law. The law cannot save anyone. Jesus saves. Hallelujah. From the uttermost to the guttermost, Jesus saves. Nothing can bridge the gap between a holy God and a sinful man but Jesus. Receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is the only one. But Paul progresses from the righteousness of the law to the righteousness of faith. He uses phrases taken from Deuteronomy 30 uh, verses 12 and 13 in certain commentary and running text with the words of the scripture as was common with the Jewish mutarist teaching. Just as Moses left the children of Israel without an excuse when they promised to keep God's law, Upon entering Canaan, Paul is leaving his original audience and his modern day readers without an excuse. The righteousness of faith is not a mystery. It is not hidden in the heavens, nor is it buried in the deep. The righteousness of faith is not attainable by human actions alone. We do not have to ascend to heaven or to launch into the deep to bring Christ and have him revealed. Christ has already done the work necessary for humans to obtain the right standing with God. That's what righteousness is, to be in right standing with God. Righteousness is not about how one dresses, because salvation is for all. Righteousness is not about whether or not you have on stockings, whether or not you have on a hairnet, whether or not you're wearing makeup. That's not what righteousness is. That's not what righteousness is at all. Righteousness is when one is in right standing with God, to be in good standing with God. It's more important that I be in good standing and I be in right standing with God than with man. So Christ descended from heaven, took on human form, and fulfilled the law of righteous of, and fulfilled the righteousness of the law by living a life free of sin. He bore the penalty of sin, suffered on the cross, died, and rose again, so that we might be declared righteous regardless of the sins we have committed. And we understand that what Jesus did for us, nobody else could do. 
The songwriter said he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt that I could not pay. Jesus paid it all. Light on the word. It's not deep. We often say it's not deep. To underscore the idea or concept is not complicated. This is what Paul is saying in the previous verses. It's not difficult or complicated to be saved because Jesus Christ has done the work on our behalf and that's required. That's all that is required in faith. We don't have to go to heaven or search the depths of the deep to find God. Jesus has already revealed himself and he paid the price for our sins. It's that simple. There is no mystery to salvation. Faith is a matter of the heart. Only believe. Now, when we talk about faith, what is faith? The scripture declares in the book of Hebrews 11 and 1, now faith is, now, right now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith, not the law. Therefore, we must possess faith. We must have faith, faith in God, not faith in the law. Not a set of rules that you go by. That's not what salvation is about. Salvation is not a set of rules or regulations that we go abide by. It's not that I'm going to disappoint uh, those in leadership or those in authority. My disappointment is, my thing is, am I going to disappoint God? That's what's important, beloved. That we do not disappoint God. That whatever happens, we ensure, we make sure that we have pleased God and done that which is pleasing and acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Faith, not the law. Look at Romans 10 and 8 says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou should confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and should believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Beloved, it is important that in order to be saved, that we call on the name of the Lord. Sin has cut us off from God, but Paul explains how to get back to God and to be saved. It's not a complicated process at all. Salvation is based in faith on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. We must confess our sins, accept in Christ to affirm our faith. God says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God hath raised Jesus from the dead, we are saved. This profession can be made by both Jew and Gentile alike, because with God there is no favoritism. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad that God don't have no big eyes or little U's? Amen. He don't have any favorites, praise God. Because with God there is no favoritism. Paul wanted both Jews and Gentiles to know that sinners need a savior to be cleansed and made whole. Yes, we must understand that in order to be saved, we need a savior. That's why the scripture declares in John 3 and 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but they should have everlasting life. Beloved, it is important that we understand that we are reminded of Paul's word. Paul reminds those believers that the word is near us. It is in our mouth and heart. It is not based on what we will or will not do, but it is based solely on faith. We must believe. The mystery of salvation, the righteousness of faith, has been revealed in Christ's word here which means that which has been uttered by our living voice the spoken word the word is the message 
Paul exhorts, the way of righteousness has come to you. It is not in the law, works, deeds, or behaviors, but it is in your mouth and in your heart. The word of faith, righteousness based on faith, is what the apostle is proclaiming. Confession is necessary as our faith drives our actions. The Greek word for save is sozo, uh, meaning to save a suffering one from perishing. Notice the difference between the conditions of the law and the righteousness of faith. The requirements of the law were impossible. Salvation by faith is easily attainable by anyone willing to confess and believe. This inward belief and outward confession speak to both Jesus as man and Jesus as God. The requirement of salvation is twofold. Confess and believe. Confession is not enough. It must be accompanied by belief. Confessing and believing allow Christ to be Lord of our lives. Though through Christ we outwardly live a life that represents Christ living on the inside. Our outward faith should be a testimony of our inward faith. Now, the belief that God raised Jesus from the dead speaks of this triumph over sin, death, and the grave. It grounds Christian belief in the historical fact of the resurrection, and it affirms God, the Father's complete power and authority over all creation. Righteousness is a right living because we are in right relationship with God. Righteousness begins in the heart. It is the belief of all your heart that Jesus took on human nature, walked among humankind, lived a life free of sin, died on the cross, and was resurrected from the dead. Belief is a requirement for God to impart righteousness, right relationship with him. This belief in our heart is confirmed and reaffirmed by confession of our mouth. Salvation means deliverance and preservation. Salvation is from God through Jesus Christ and not based on the works of righteousness. Salvation results from believing in the heart and confessing with the mouth. The belief in the heart and the confession of the mouth provides the Christian with redemption from wages of sin and preservation of etern from eternal damnation. The salvation of the Christian is both in the present and the future. We are saved and we will be saved. The Christian is called to live victor victoriously and abundantly in this life now because of the promise of the life to come. Light of the word, do you believe? That's what it boils down to tonight, beloved. Do you believe? Our actions do not save us. So there is nothing magical about speaking the words, the Lord Jesus. The change comes. Listen now. The change comes when we believe in our hearts. Head knowledge and heart belief are different. You can know a thing and yet not believe it in your heart. So head heart. Head knowledge and heart belief are different. Knowledge informs belief, and belief influences behavior. Notice, notice this now. Knowledge informs belief, and belief influences behavior. What I believe, that's how I'm going to act. So I'm going to act how I believe. A heart that believes becomes a life that is transformed because we think differently. We live differently. No change in lifestyle equals no belief. The message is to believe that God exists. He is the creator and he provides salvation and right standing to his creation through Jesus Christ. This message exceeds time and supersedes context and culture. Justification and righteousness are rooted in the proclamation with our mouth and belief in our heart. It is important, beloved, that we believe the word of God. Yes, and after believing, we must act on the word of God. Yes, only in doing that. Only in believing what the word says. Only in acting upon our belief can we be saved. It's not just about uttering some words. Not just about saying, Lord, save me. But believe it in your heart and acting upon that. 
Salvation is for all who believe. It's to every creature, every man, woman, boy, or girl. All you have to do as a person is to believe and to accept the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. Well, beloved, we thank God that we're out of time, but we're certainly not out of message. We want to pause here for a moment to see whether or not there are any questions or concerns about that which we have discussed on tonight. Let's pause for some questions. Well, hopefully, praise God, you had some questions tonight. If you did not have any questions, I hope all y'all turned your TVs down, off, muted, or did something, praise God. I hope y'all ain't got me on here tonight fussing about no TVs and all that stuff, praise God. Amen. I hope you don't, praise God. I hope some of y'all like acting right. Well, I love you in spite of, amen. I love you. We thank God for the lesson tonight. Salvation is for all who believe. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this lesson tonight. We thank you for your people tonight. It is our prayer, Lord, that you continue to bless us. God, that you continue to help us and give us everything that we need. God, we pray tonight that salvation would avail itself to those who are not saved. God, that you would save those who are lost. For we are seeking you. We are looking unto you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. It is our prayer now that you would continue to bless and help us. Give us strength at this hour. Bless us the more in Jesus' name. And we shall forever lift you up, give you all glory, all honor, and all praise. For these and other blessings are we asking now. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, thank God and amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining. But be sure to join us next week, same time, same place. Until then, be blessed is my prayer for you. And we want you to have a wonderful, wonderful evening. God bless you. Thank you for watching Zion Temple Ministries. Be sure to tune in to worship with us via Facebook Live and YouTube each Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. on Facebook Live Stream and every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. for our Tuesday night teaching Bible study. You can also check out our worship opportunities by visiting our website at www.ztministriestn.com. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you soon.